Good afternoon and welcome to this Euro webinar organized by the European School of Urology. My name is Manuel Ferraro. I'm a nephrologist from Rome and I will act as the moderator for the session, which will feature some very interesting talks, including medical management of calcium oxalate stones, which will be presented by Dr. Straub from Munich, medical expulsive therapy by Dr. Petkova from Sofia, and the medical management of uric acid stones by Dr. Mines from Madrid. During the webinar, you can submit your questions through the question portal and the panel will discuss them at the end of each talk. Finally, let me remind you that this webinar is accredited when you complete the final question. So let's move on with the first speaker. There has been a slight change in the order of talks, so Dr. Straub will talk about medical management of calcium oxalate stones. Dr. Straub, please, the virtual floor is yours. Dear Professor Ferrao, thank you very much for this uh, introduction. I will give a short overview on the medical management of calcium oxalate stones. And uh, for this uh, intention, I would like um, to give uh, some aspects on the physiology. I would like to discuss with you preventive general measures and I would like uh, to focus on the pharmacological prevention uh, possibilities that we have in calcium oxalate stones. When we are speaking about calcium oxalate stones, it is very important that we have an idea where calcium oxalate crystals form in the kidney because our diagnosis that we use for calcium oxalate stone metabolics is most times 24 hour uh, urine collection and blood sample. But the urine that we get does not really represent the urine in the kidney, which is responsible for crystal formation. This is depicted here in this uh, slide, you see a nephron and you see the oxalate and calcium concentrations along the nephron. And you will see that the highest concentrations are in the interstitium between the loop of Hanley and the collecting duct. And these concentrations differ significantly from the concentrations in urine. So the urine that we have available for our diagnosis does not really represent all problems that a calcium oxalate patient can have. The second point is that we should have a little bit an idea on the oxalate transport in the kidney and that the oxalate transport is connected to the sodium and um, to the proton transport on the one hand, but also to the chloride and bicarbonate transport on the other hand. This influences directly our strategies as we know that for example um, sodium uh, chloride reduced diet is very good for stone formers and we also know that stone formers may have different uh, difficulties with their acid base balance. So both things can be addressed directly to the function in the proximal tubule. A second functionary problem is uh, the, the gut kidney problem, which is represented by patients with bariatric surgery, with bowel resection or short bowel syndrome. All these patients have um, a malabsorption of bile acids on the bowel side. And through a lot of mechanism, this will be answered in the kidney by an increased oxalate excretion, which is then the, the risk uh, increase for stone formation. So there is a direct connection between gut and kidney in terms of risk management when it comes to oxalate stone formation. If you look here to this uh, work from 2004, it was the Bonn group at that time and they were very interested in um, metabolic and in dietary questions concerning calcium oxalate stone formation, they did a very interesting test. They gave uh, calcium oxalate stone patients different amount of calcium and what they saw was that they could influence calcium absorption in gut controlled by the 13C met the, um, method. And so they, they could really demonstrate that if you give a patient of 
who forms calcium oxalate stones, higher amount of calcium, this patient will absorb less calcium in the gut than a patient with lower calcium. And this, I think, um, was the basis for um, the removal of the hypothesis that calcium patients always need a calcium restrictive diet. So I think this is a very, very important information for all calcium oxalate stone formers. Coming to the diet, it's mainly the discussion on water, salt and uh, nutrition. And if you look into the papers uh, of the recent years, they are not too much, but there is uh, one newer one, um, it's a meta-analysis and a systematic review. And once more, uh, this uh, paper demonstrated that it's fluid intake, uh, which influences really directly the risk of stone formation. And you see that low fluid intake increases the risk in all uh, the papers uh, that were, they were included here in, into this, um, in, this uh, meta-analysis. So low fluid intake is a big risk factor for calcium oxalate stone formation, also for other stones but we speak about around 80% of all stone formers forming calcium oxalate. So this is the majority and here high fluid intake is very important. The next topic is salt, sodium chloride. And you know that there were a different work on sodium chloride. The first very important one by Borgi in 2002, who showed that uh, Diet uh, poor in sodium chloride and protein is better for calcium oxalate stone formers than a, a calcium restrictive diet. And this uh, paper here, it's uh, from 2014, confirmed this finding in male and female stone formers. Uh, they had all a higher ingestion of salt, of, uh, salt than uh, the control persons who did no form no stones. So salt intake matters undoubtedly. Coming to the studies behind all our knowledge on calcium oxalate prevention, these are not too much. And uh, Fink and colleagues did a great work here and, and published it in 2012. And between this work and nowadays, there is not really another big paper who changed something, who was a game changer in the field. And you see, we are basing our knowledge on calcium oxalate on around about 28 RCTs, eight on diet, 20 on medication. And when it comes to diet, and if you have the criteria of evidence-based medicine, the dietary interventions were all with mixed response. You had no clear significance um, in, in these uh, comparisons. So, what we should focus on is really that diet, that fluid management are important things, but the medication is maybe the most important one that you can give to the patient. So I would summarize the first part of my talk that water and salt matters, no doubt about it, that medication will be important and diet, I think it's a matter of debate, especially because patients are not always adhering to the recommendation that they got. And this is a paper from Bernie Hess in, in Bern. He's a, a big guy, nephrologist, dealing with stones since 40 years. And he found it very, very interesting from his uh, uh, stone clinic. He asked uh, his patients, on the measures that he recommended. And what he found was that 87% um, percent of the patients follow, followed six to seven days a week to his medication recommendation. But only 26 followed to the diet and lifestyle recommendation, which means only one quarter of the patients will follow to your fluid, to your diet, uh, to your lifestyle advice and this means that this treatment does not reach the patient while the medication will reach the patient and this i think is very important to keep in mind therefore we should ask who is dedicated for medical treatment and uh, the eau and the guideline gives us uh, a nice algorithm since years 
which differs between low-risk stone formers and high-risk stone formers. And the low-risk stone formers, these are people who will form a stone or a recurrent stone with less than 20 or 30% or probability, while the recurrent stone formers have a very high stone recurrence risk, more than 50% during lifetime. And this is very important differentiation of the patient. So these 25% of all stone formers, they need more than a general advice. They need specific medication. And if you try to fix these high-risk patients, these are more than only calcium oxalate patients. But you will find here some very important points like early onset of the disease, like solitary kidney, like hyperparathyroidism, like nephrocalcinosis and gastrointestinal diseases. These are all risk factors for calcium oxalate stone disease. And I think this we have to keep in mind if we have a calcium oxalate patient uh, above um, in front of us during our consultation. We have to ask for gastrointestinal problems, for nephrocalcinosis or other diseases. So this very complex algorithm gives you an overview on all the medication and all the treatment interventions you have available if it comes to medical treatment of calcium oxalate stones. You see that it's also not only hypercalciuria and hyperoxaluria, but also hypocytroduria, hyperuricosuria, and hypomagnesuria, which can influence the stone formation and which has to be treated if you can find it during the diagnosis and the, the lab evaluation of the patient, which has to be treated specifically that the patient will lower his risk for stone formation. This complex algorithm can be um, translated into an easier picture, I think, when you keep in mind that round about 26 to 67, depending to the country and um, depending uh, to the population, um, that 26 to 67 percent of the patients can um, develop hyperoxaluria and the next high proportion are patients with hypercalciuria. All the other disturbances, hypocytridurea, uh, hyperuricosuria, or hypomagnesuria as not, are not as common as hyperoxaluria and hypercalciuria. This is very important and this should be your driving force in assessing the patient. So if you have a hypercalciuric patient and you have excluded the hyperparathyroidism or renal tubular acidosis as the underlying cause, then you have your medication that you can give the patient. And in this case, it would be thiocytes. If you have a hyperuricosuric patient, it is allopurinol. But if you have a patient with gastrointestinal disease with secondary hyperoxaluria, it is not calcium restriction. It is calcium supplementation that you offer the patient because this patient will benefit from complexing calcium and oxalate in the bowels and excreting it with the feces that it does not reach the kidney where it can form calcium oxalate crystals. So the main content of this slide here is that you really have to identify the risk profile of your calcium oxalate patient and then really adapt the medication to the patient's risk and please do not give three or four tablets to a patient because the patient will never adhere to this uh, amount of pills during the day. It is more important that you give one for the most important risk factor than three to cover all potential risk factors that the patient has. One of the most important people in um, metabolic treatment of patients here in Europe, I think, was during the last years Hans Göran Tiselius from Sweden. And um, he published in 2016 a very nice uh, work where he could show that patients who had uh, thiocytes or uh, who had uh, potassium citrate, 
they had or they experienced less stone recurrences than patients only under conservative, let's say with diet and fluid intake treatment. Um, so that his um, conclusion was, despite the lack of solid scientific evidence, the recommendation to choose a selective preventive treatment with the aim of correcting abnormal urinary target risk variables is likely to be superior to a non-selective approach. And I think this is the main uh, message to all of you. If you have a risk that you can address, then you should treat this risk. So let me come to my take home messages for you. Increased fluid intake should achieve at least two liters of urine per day. This is for all stone formers and so also for calcium oxalate stone formers important. Salt intake is a matter and you should critically ask your patient about the salt intake. It should not be more than five to six grams per day. And if you have a patient who has specific problem, who has specific risk and who is recurrent stone former, please get an idea on his risk profile and then treat very selectively. So this patient will have really benefit from your treatment. And once more, please keep in mind that medication will be more effective because of better patient adherence than diet and lifestyle corrections, which are easier, but not as effective. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, please stay healthy in these, uh, yes, very interesting times. Thank you very much, Dr. Straub, for this very, uh, very nice presentation. Uh, there are a few questions from the from the audience. Uh, we know that you have an urgency in the year, so we try to to select the, the most important ones. There are at the moment three three questions for you. So one is related to uh, primary hyperoxaluria, and the participant is asking whether combined liver and renal transplant is still the only option for treating primary hyperoxaluria. So the, the strategy in primary hyperoxaluria is that you try to postpone this transplantation need, but in the end, if uh, kidney function is deteriorated, you have no other option than simultaneous transplantation of liver and kidney. There is primary hyperoxaluria with different types, and maybe you know that there is a type 3, which behaves a little bit different compared to type 1 and type 2. So for the type 3, I think this liver and kidney transplant is not needed with the same uh, urgency than in type 1 and type 2. But for the first and more common types, I would claim that this is the final treatment for the patients. Okay. And in terms of the new treatments, maybe maybe it's uh, worth mentioning that there are some uh, studies on RNA interference, like uh, lumaziran, these new drugs yeah. that are uh, aimed at, for example, lumaziran at uh, inhib inhibiting uh, uh, messenger RNA for glycolate oxidase that can be can be useful, especially for uh, type one primary hyperoxaluria. So there is but another question. To my, to my knowledge, uh, th this medication for the moment is not available in Germany. I think they are in the approval process for Germany. I know about studies that were also performed by Bernd Hoppe here in, in Bonn, but uh, for for the general public, I think it's not available for them. Yeah, yeah. There, there are some very promising, very promising uh, drugs. There is a question on uh, uh, the role of restriction of uh, animal protein in diet, whether this can be associated with a reduction in uh, the rate of stone formation. So the, the animal protein at the final end um, will al always pass the liver. And when it comes to the liver, you have the, the, the glycine uh, metabolism. And from the glycine metabolism, you will go directly into oxalate. So what um, studies showed is that the combination out of high protein intake and uh, high salt intake will increase your calcium excretion as well as your oxalate excretion and both 
is really um, not very favorable for calcium oxalate stone formers. So the recommendation is five to six grams of sodium per day and uh, coming to the, to the animal protein, which was uh, the, the primary focus of the question, the recommendation is that you give around about 0.8 to 1 gram per kilogram body weight and day, but it's pure animal protein, which means that a piece of meat does not uh, consist only out of protein. So you have a little bit to balance and if you have to go into detail, I think you need a dietitian uh, for, for recommendation, which meat or which sausage would be appropriate to hold this balance, but it should be at the final end not more than one gram of uh, animal protein per kilogram body weight and day in an adult person. For children, there is an exception, but for children, you have to calculate this amount very individually. Okay, very, very final question regarding your taking on the use of allopurinol in patients with the calcium oxalate stones who are not, who don't, do not have any other uh, metabolic abnormalities. Would you recommend? So, Allopurinol is only indicated in patients when you have uh, performed a 24-hour urine collection and you found hyperuricosuria. Then this hyperuricosuric state of the patient should be corrected with allopurinol. If the patient has an excretion more than 4 millimole per day, this is too much and the patient will have crystal growth on uric acid, calcium oxalate, and vice versa, because uric acid and calcium oxalate crystals can grow on each other. And the intention of this uh, manipulation of uric acid is that you remove the uric acid crystals out of the urine, and then the calcium oxalate crystals have no place where they can grow. So they may be stay in solution, and therefore, and the purinol makes only sense if the patient has really hyperuricous uric urine. Okay, thank you, Dr. Straub. Thank you very much for, for presenting and for answering some of the, of the questions coming in. At this point, I would move to the next to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Straub. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Petkova from Sofia. Her talk is about medical expulsive therapy. Please, Dr. Petkova. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Petkova and I'm a urologist from Sofia, Bulgaria. I would like to thank the EU and the European School of Urology for inviting me to join this webinar. My topic for today is renal colic and controversies in medical expulsive therapy. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. Renal colic due to ureteral stones is common and accounts for approximately 1% of emergency room visits. Ureteral stones can be managed by observation with or without medical explosive therapy, drainage of the kidney with subsequent treatment of the stone, shockwave hitotripsy, or ureteroscopy. The indications for expectant management include well-controlled pain, absence of infection and sepsis, and no deterioration of renal function. Observation for ureteral stones has several advantages, such as non-invasiveness, no risks related to stone intervention and anesthesia, and low cost. However, expectant management has the disadvantage of uh, risk of recurrent pain episodes and impaired quality of life, complications from ureteral obstruction, sick leave from, from work, and it requires a regular follow-up of patients in order to prevent complications. Understanding the natural history of ureteral stones helps recognize patients who are most likely to test their stones and who are uh, amenable to conservative management. Many factors influence spontaneous stone passage rates, such as stone size and location, which are the most important ones, ureteral anatomy, presence of mucosal edema and inflammation, and ureteral smooth muscle spasm. 
it is estimated that the majority of stones up to 4 millimeters would fade spontaneously within 40 days. A recently published review on the natural history of conservatively managed ureteral stones, including more than 6,600 patients, found a 64% overall stone passage rate without any medical or surgical intervention within four weeks. These two ureteral stones and stones smaller than 5 millimeters, irrespective of stone location, were most likely to pass spontaneously, making observation a suitable option for selected patients. The aims of the pharmacological treatment of ureteral stones are pain relief, prevention of recurrent colic episodes, and promotion of stone expulsion. Many agents have been investigated as medical explosive therapies, such as non steroid anti inflammatory drugs because of their analgesic and anti inflammatory effects, alpha blockers and calcium channel blockers because of their effects on the ureteral smut muscle, and corticosteroids because of their effects on mucosa and inflammation. The rationale for using alpha blockers as medical explosive therapy comes from the presence of alpha adrenergic receptors in the human ureter. Alpha adrenergic receptor blockade causes relaxation of the smooth muscle whilst maintaining tonic propulsive contractions, which may aid spontaneous stone passage. The role of alpha blockers as medical explosive therapy has been evaluated in multiple randomized trials and meta analysis with controversial results. So what is the evidence? Several published meta-analyses and systematic reviews found higher and faster expulsion rates, lower analgesic requirements, fewer colic episodes, and fewer hospitalizations between treatment groups. Therefore, based on the evidence, the EU guidelines in 2015 recommended alpha blockers as medical explosive therapy in patients with newly diagnosed small ureteral stones if active removal is not indicated, with level of evidence 1A and greatest recommendation A. Despite all the available evidence, the authors of meta-analysis recognized that they still had some limitations. Most of the included studies were small, single institution, low quality studies with significant heterogeneity in study design with methods of stone size calculation in reporting of data and definitions of primary endpoints, inadequate or unclear allocation concealment, and lack of blinding was found in most of the studies. The authors recognized the presence of publication bias as most studies with negative results are less likely to be published. All of these emphasize the need of high quality, large multicenter, randomized placebo controlled studies in order to confirm the beneficial effects of alpha blockers as medical explosive therapy. The first large prospective multicenter randomized placebo controlled trial was published in 2015 by the group of Picard, the SUSPEND trial. It involved 24 UK centers with more than 1,000 patients, randomized to tamsulazine, mifedipine, and placebo. The primary endpoint of the study was absence of need for intervention to assist stone passage at four weeks. The study found no statistically significant differences between groups in terms of the primary study endpoint, and these findings were consistent across the groups of stone size and location. However, the SUSPEND trial was criticized that the lack of intervention is an imprecise surrogate for stone passage, which was not confirmed by a CT scan. The majority of stones were smaller than 5 millimeters, which may have contributed to the high stone passage rates in all groups. Furthermore, medication compliance was not monitored and secondary outcomes were assessed with patient questionnaires, which had lower follow-up rates. Further randomized trials and more meticulous systematic reviews and meta-analysis tried to resolve these controversies the Picard trial has created. Recent randomized trials found no benefit at all or only a small benefit for tamsulazine, mainly for these two ureteral stones larger than 5 millimeters. However, both data from meta-analysis still supported the use of alpha blockers with medical explosive therapy. 
A recent systematic review tried to address this issue and analyze data from high quality randomized trial and meta analysis. The conclusions of the authors were that the strength of evidence for the benefit of medical explosive therapy in ureteral stones is low, even for distal ureteral stones larger than 5 mm, and that it is up to clinicians to decide whether to follow single trials or meta analysis. However, the authors still recognized that alpha blockers may still play a certain role, but only in well counseled informed patients with larger stones. Despite all the controversies, the current EAU guidelines recommend alpha blockers as medical explosive therapy for distal ureteral stones larger than 5 mm amenable to conservative management. The AUA guidelines recommend observation with medical explosive therapy for uncomplicated ureteral stones smaller than 10 mm. But what is the patient's perspective? A recent survey evaluated patient attitudes towards medical explosive therapy following the SUSPEND trial. Patients were explained to the controversial results of in for medical explosive therapy. And despite that, half of them would still try explosive therapy for ureteral stones. And over 70% of the patients would prioritize medical or surgical therapy when possible. In conclusion, current international guidelines recommend medical explosive therapy for ureteral stones if active treatment is not indicated. The evidence on medical explosive therapy between randomized trials and meta-analysis is conflicting. Most recent high-quality randomized trials are showing no benefit for medical explosive therapy, whereas meta-analysis tend to show limited benefit, mostly for distal stones larger than 5 mm. However, both randomized trials and meta-analysis have some shortcomings and methodological limitations. Therefore, patients should be informed about the contradicting results and that the use of alpha blockers for medical explosive therapy is off-label. Urologist's decision on whether to prescribe explosive therapy should be based on critical analysis of the available evidence, selection of patients suitable for observation, and patients' preference. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petkova, for your for your talk. Very interesting. And we have time for some questions which are coming in. So the first one is uh, whether we uh, whether alpha blockers can be used in pregnant patients. Well, in pregnant patients, we try to use the minimal medications possible. Me personally, I haven't prescribed alpha blockers for pregnant patients. So I think there are no studies on the use of alpha blockers in pregnancy. So I personally wouldn't do that. Okay. So we have a question on uh, the, the, the loss of the loss of renal function, the, how, how quick the patient will lose renal function in, uh, in facing ureteric obstruction. And the participant is asking whether they are, there are new studies or whether the, the knowledge is um, still re uh, related to the uh, experimental studies on, uh, uh, on animal models. Well, if we decide to go for conservative management, we have to make it clear to the patients that they have to be followed up regularly in order to prevent uh, these complications. So we always advise patients to come to regular ultrasound checks for obstruction because when they have no pain, patients tend not to come to visit the doctor and we have silent obstructions and we end with non-functioning kidneys. Usually in our department when we decide to do uh, medical explosive therapy and conservative management of patients, we wait two to three weeks maximum before going to an intervention. So 
we do not tend to wait over 40 days in patients with obstruction because we risk loss of kidney function. Okay, and then there is an interesting question on what to do with the asymptomatic patient with the evidence of mild hydronephrosis with uh, approximately five millimeter ureteral stone. So is, is in this case, uh, medical expulsive therapy, would you recommend it? And for, for how long, for how much time? Well, the size of the stone is not the only factor in spontaneous stone passage, of course. In our department, we use medical expulsive therapy, of course, in selected patients. In patients with a distal ureteral stone of, stone of five or four millimeters and with mild hydronephrosis, we would try medical expulsive therapy at least for two weeks to 20 days. And if there is no spontaneous stone passage, we would go for an intervention. In these COVID times, patients tend to favor medical therapy, but we also see a lot of complications because of this reason. Okay, there is, a, there is a question coming in on whether there are indications for use of the flazacort as in medical expulsive therapy. Would you, would you? Well, I have no experience. We do not usually prescribe in our practice here in Sofia corticosteroids. Our medical expulsive therapy, you, for medical expulsive therapy, we usually use non steroid anti inflammatory drugs, some uh, fetal, uh, fetal agents like Vatinex or other fetal agents uh, and alpha uh, blockers and of course spasmolytics. But uh, there is evidence that uh, corticosteroids may help with uh, medical explosive therapy because of their anti-inflammatory and anti-edematose effects. Okay, there are, there are uh, a few questions uh, very similar related to the minimum age for medical expulsive therapy or whether you would recommend uh, its use in, uh, in the pediatric population or, or, or there is no age limit based on your experience or guidelines. Well, most of the guidelines recommend medical explosive therapy for adults. Uh, me personally, I don't have any experience in the pediatric population because we don't treat pediatric patients in our center. And I would refrain for giving recommendation on pediatric patients because I have no personal experience. But most of the guidelines are, and most of the randomized trials are on adult populations. Okay, there are some other questions coming in, and I think we have some some time to to answer some other of these ones. So there is a question regarding the uh, the drug the class effect. So whether tamsulosine is, uh, I mean, it is the most studied uh, alpha blocker in the group, uh, and the participant is asking whether the there is a role of other agents or, and whether these are uh, similarly effective compared with tamsulosine. There are a lot of randomized trials, not only on tamsulosine, but also on alfuzuzin, uh, suggesting a class effect of alpha blockers. Of course, tamsulosine is the most studied agent. There is a recent randomized trial uh, suggesting that silodosine also has uh, a beneficial effect as medical explosive therapy for these two ureteral stones. So I think that we can use whatever alpha blocker we have uh, available in our countries. Silodosine also could be used. Okay, so there is no there is no particular advantage advantage of tamsulosine over over other drugs of the, of the same class. Uh, Okay, I, just the just last question. That there are some other coming in, but there is not much time to, to go through all of them. Uh, and the use regarding the use of diazepam, would you recommend using it during a, during a ureteral colic? 
We do not routinely use it in our practice, so we stick to non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs and we rarely use opioids, only in patients with intractable pain which cannot be controlled by the other means. But it, it depends on the local guidelines, I think. Okay, so I think we can uh, conclude this, this uh, section of the webinar. So thank you, Dr. Petkova, for, for your presentation and for answering the, the questions from the audience. And then we move on with the last speaker for today with an interesting talk on the medical management of uric acid zones. Dr. Minus, please. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank the EAU and many thanks to the EULIS for the invitation today. It's an honor and a great pleasure to participate in this webinar with my Stones friends. I, today I have to talk about medical treatment focus on uric acid stones. And I think it's a, um, a big topic because uric acid stones are key, unique in humans and its medical treatment is very specific and, and special. So this is my disclaimers. Um, so, uh, uric acid stone represent a significant percentage of urolithiasis. They are the second most frequent after calcium stones and have a high probability of recurrency more than others. Another characteristic of these stones is that are radiolucent and cannot be seen in a KUV, for example. And the most important thing is the uric acid stones are the only ones that can be completely dissolved with medical treatment. We know that the stone formation is a disbalance between the urinary inhibitors and the promoters, with uri urinary pH acting in many occasions at balance. The formation of one stone or another could be determined by the disbalances resulting from this chart. However, Everyone knows that the stone formation process is much more complex than this. In uric acid stones, low urinary volume, the increase in urate concentration in the 24 hours during collection, and especially the persistence of a low urinary pH are the fundamental elements of the stone formation. These three points will be the target of our medical treatment. All conditions contributing to low urinary output will increase uric acid supersaturation and the risk of a stone formation. A higher risk of uric acid stone has been reported in factories with high temperature surroundings and countries, countries like Israel, for example, related to the hot environment. And that is why we have to avoid dehydration by increasing our fluid intakes. The use of sodium bicarbonate waters and citrus juices increase urinary pH and the level of urinary citrate. This represents an important inhibiting factor of uric acid stone formation. Drinking alcohol of soft drink causes obesity, metabolic syndrome, and hyperuricemic states, so they should be avoided. Uric acid is the final product of purine metabolism. Hyperuricosuria is defined as uric acid excretion, more than 750 mg per day in adults, and may be a result of purine dietary excess and endogenous overproduction. Hyperuricemia may be present also, but there is only weak evidence of its association with the stone formation. In order to prevent hyperuricosuria, uric acid stone formers benefits from the reduction of purine in their diet. They should try to reduce their animal protein intake by replacing them with vegetable protein. And we must promote a healthy lifestyle to our patients that avoid obesity and diabetes mellitus. Regarding treatment with allopurinol, 
there are differences between the European and American guidelines. While the European guidelines recommend prescribing allopurinol in the presence of hyperuricosuria with a strong recommendation, the American guidelines only advise it in case of failure in potassium citrate treatment, like expert opinion. Can you see many differences between the two pictures? Maybe not. If we look at the global prevalences of obesity and urinary stone, we can see few, few differences. The increase in obesity over the last years is reflected in the increase in urinary uric acid stone. So the pictures are very, very similar. We know that urinary pH is very important for the formation of some stones. Infective stones will benefit from alkaline urine, while uric acid and cysteine stones need an acid urinary pH for crystallization. Low urinary, P urinary pH is the most important factor in the formation of these types of acids. At a pH of 5.8, only 50% of, of uric acid is in soluble form. The remaining 50% are in crystal form. The decrease in urinary pH is associated with lower urinary ammonia excretion observed in metabolic syndrome. This may also explain the association between obesity and aciduria. It's for this reason that the EAU guidelines establish narrow urinary pH margin from 6.2 to 6.8 for recurrences prevention and 6.5 to 7.2 for chemolysis. In fact, there is a strong recommendation to use medication to alkalinize the urine. As we know, urinary pH changes during the day, is more acidic during the night. So we must tell the patient to take the medical treatment and fluid circadianly. Uh, we can also observe in the right table the low concentration of uric acid when we get the pH that produce the solubility. Oral chemolysis was first described in 1933 by Bjorn. There are different oral treatments to perform the stone chemolysis. Potassium citrate is the most often used regimen for oral dissolution therapy. We usually prescribe potassium citrate with an initial dose of 20 milli equivalent three times per day, and we change the dose later based on follow-up urine uh, pH control. Therefore, controlling urinary pH is the key to reaching our goals. The most frequent side effect in potassium citrate um, are mild gastrointestinal pain, and we can avoid it with the intake of enough fluid or meals. Instead, Instead, a potentially dangerous side effect is hyperkalemia. So we have to, pres to prescribe blood tests routinely. If, pot if potassium citrate was not be tolerated, it could be replaced by sodium bicarbonate for oral treatment. Patients with chronic kidney disease should try sodium bicarbonate first because it is less dangerous for them. However, taking sodium salt could promote an increase in urinary calcium excretion and therefore a predisposition to the calcium stone formation. Another way to, in to increase the urinary pH is a non-pharmacological treatment with oral or lemon juice. We know that orange juice has high potassium citrate content and lemon juice contains mostly citric acid. And therefore, lemonade is much less effective in raising the urinary pH than the orange juice. Success rate for oral dissolution therapy at three months ranges from 30 to 70 depends on publication. Patient with a urethral stent, low body weight, and low serum uric acid values 
significantly increase the success rate of oral chemolysis. Publication have reported complete dissolution in patient after treatment from six weeks to six months. However, to continue on clinicization for more than six months is recommended in patient showing partial dissolution. It should be noted that the most of the publication of this topic were of low quality or involved a limited number of patients. I want to comment at this point the possibility of the recent discovery of a specific inhibitor of uric acid crystallization in urine. In 2014, Dr. Grasses from Spain evaluated the ability of methyl xanthines to inhibit uric acid crystallization. He discovered that zeobromine, present in a big concentration in cocoa products, is an inhibitor of uric acid crystal growth and nucleation. After observing this theobromine characteristic in vitro, his team communicated in 2018 the effect of eating different products made from cocoa on the crystallization of uric acid in 20 healthy volunteers. The crystallization of uric acid was significantly lower after eating powder or dark chocolate relative to the to the milk chocolate consumers and control group. This increase in theobromine concentration in this group of volunteers translated into a lower risk of uric acid uh, crystallization. Recently, a research group from India has published similar conclusion to those presented by Dr. Grasses. In fact, the last month, the first in the last month, the first experience in patient with uric acid stone has been presented with promising results. So perhaps soon we will be able to incorporate zeobromine as a selective uric acid stone inhibitor, but we need more prospective uh, studies with a large number of patients for a strong recommendation. So in conclude, uric acid stone can be completely dissolved with medical treatment. This is the only ones. Low urine, urinary volume, hyperuricosuria, and persist, persistently low urinary pH are the most important factors to uric acid stone formation. We must prescribe alkaline citrate to alkalinize the urine in uric stone forms, and we must control the urinary pH. And perhaps theobromine will be a new uric acid crystal inhibitors. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Minus. Very, very nice presentation. Very nice data. Thank you. So there are some questions from the audience that I would like to forward to you. So the question is uh, related to your thoughts about high fructose intake and whether this has a role on the uh, excretion of uric acid in the, in the urine. I'm sorry, sorry? Intake of fructose from diet and the relationship with the uric acid uh, excretion in the urine. I, I, I don't understand the factors to what the kind of a fact fructose, factors? Fructose. Fractals. Oh, I don't understand fractals, sorry. Fractose is a, is a carbohydrate which is find in, found in the in diet, you know, in, in, uh, is a polymer. Fractose is, uh, I think I'm going to, did, did you get the answer? Did, did you get the question? Okay. Fractose has a, has a very complex effect on uh, on uh, urine composition and uh, the the participant is asking whether there is uh, a relationship with uric acid uh, excretion so i think the caveat is that uh, the the first of all the the association between uric acid excretion and uh, and stone formation is not so strong as for other as for other uh, 
lithogenic salts. Uh, but it's true that the intake of fructose can increase uh, excretion of uric acid as well as it can increase excretion of calcium because it uh, interferes with calcium metabolism and with uh, tubular uh, handling of calcium. And it is also possible that high fructose intake uh, increases urine oxalate by basically being a substrate for, for oxalate formation. So high fructose is, is uh, really a risk factor for dietary risk factor for uh, for kidney stone formation, as it comes out from from uh, several observational studies. So there is, there is also a similar question uh, which touches upon fructose, and is asking whether the amount of fructose in the, in the juices, in orange juice especially. Can be can be seen as a risk factor for for kidney stones. Yes, we, we usually prescribe our urine juice because we know is 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 there are a lot of citrate potassium citrate, and um, in 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 many patients with hypocitraturia or or something like that is 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 possible uh, to increase the citrate and other is. Um, Oh, um, fructose. Okay, sorry. Okay. 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 Um, 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 sorry. Um, and you know, normally used in, for 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 increased pH, uh, urinary pH. We know that the the most important thing is is is, is the the low urinary pH. So all the all the treatment of the dietary um, dietary recommendation is is um, to to avoid the the low urinary pH. We know that the fructose is, is, is important and, or, or is important to prevent the diabetes mainly to the, the hyperinsulinic states. So, so we have to try no, no, no take sugars, no the, uh, another glucosa or something like that. But in, in case of, of foreign juice, it's more important the, the potassium citrate and, and the citric uh, acid in, in, the, in case of lemonade than the fructose in, in this case. So it's like the, the alkali content of orange juice is kind of offsetting the, the effect of fructose in the, in the urine. So there is a question regarding the use of allopurinol in patients with the high serum urate levels. So, and the, and the specific question is whether you would recommend the use of allopurinol in patients with uh, uh, hyperuricemia without doing a 24-hour urine collection to assess for hyperuricosuria. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, in, in the EU guidelines, uh, we know the, the algorithm said that if we diagnose hyperuricosuria, uh, we have to prescribe a uh, hyaluronol. So we have to perform a 24-hour collection for this kind of patient. Or oh, in, in 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 other way, if you have a hyperkalemia, uh, hyperuricaemia, uh, it's important to prevent the gout. Gout is an uh, important disease, and you can uh, derivate in, in urolithiasis. And you have to prevent with 100 to 300 allopurinol treatment. And but I my my personal recommendation is in this kind of, of patient always take a 24 hours uh, collection to, to have a, a correct diagnosis of hyperuricosuria. Okay, then would you treat a patient with an acute renal colic and uric acid retires this with alkalinizers? Yes, this, this is an a update of the last uh, EAU guidelines. When do you have a acute renal colic and you su suspect um, uh, uric acid lithiasis, you have to, to prescribe not only medical expulsive therapy, you have to prescribe alkalinization also, because we, we know that the possible of, of expulsing the, the, the lithiasis is, is um, higher with combined the treatments. Okay, there is a question uh, do you commonly use? ESWL together with oral chemolysis? 
Yo, de external software y tu tritzi. So there is one question that, that, is, that say what about allopurinol, but I think it's it's yeah. kind of generic. <laughs> you already touched on that. So uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think do you have uh, try always first to to chemolysis. Uh, do you have a unique opportunity to 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 dissolve the the stone first to to um, to prescribe another kind of treatment? Okay, there is a question related to the prescription of a potassium uh, potassium citrate in the, in patients with low GFR. Would you recommend it? Would you use some cautions? Would you not use it? Um, uh, I I always try to um, to first uh, know what is the urinary pH of the patient. If the urinary pH of the patient is five point five, uh, close to six. Uh, we try always um, increase the urinary pH with a non-pharmacological treatment, always with diet. But if the patient has a very low pH, uh, like five or something like that, I have to recommend treatment, oral treatment. Uh, I usually try to use uh, sodium bicarbonate. Uh, on, only try, uh, don't try uh, oral um, uh, sodium bicarbonate. If the patient have a high blood uh, high blood pay, uh, pressure, um, and, and then try to combine to combine um, sodium bicarbonate or potassium citrate with with oran with oran juice or 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 less uh, less patient lemon juice, but always try to combine to to oral treatment with oran juice first. Okay, so if I can add. Uh, a little bit on that because I think that the question was more uh, concerned of the who posed the question was a, was a, a more concerned about the risk of hyperkalemia uh, relative to potassium citrate supplementation in uh, patients with low GFR. Uh, in some countries, for example, in Italy, there are some formulation of, uh, of uh, calcium citrate salts which are uh, more beneficial for. Uh, for the low GFR or patients with CKD with chronic kidney disease, because the, you can you you basically give calcium supplementations to these patients together with uh, with the citrate and do not increase the, the risk of uh, hyperkalemia in these patients. So, say so we we have some treatment here. Combine see uh, potassium citrate and magnesium citrate. To, to try to avoid a lot of uh, potassium in, in, in this kind of patient, for example. Okay. And there are and there are a few questions I think very very interesting on the uh, how do you uh, advise the patient on monitoring their their urine pH at home? Yeah, this is a, a, a very good question because as I said before, controlling the pH is the most important thing to to achieve the the chemolysis, no? Traditionally, I use the, the reagent strips, but now uh, we have um, a portable electric pH meter. It's a digital one. This pH meter was developed by Debbie Kerr in Spain, and it's so easy to use because it has only one button, and it's not very expensive. And, and, and I prescribe this, this pH meter. I, I, uh, in this way, our patient, are the main actor on their treatment and i think by empowering the the patient we we improve their their treatment uh, um, the treatment compliance i, I okay. think it's the key to control the ph the urinary ph is the key for this kind of patient and is there a special timing that you advise your patients to to check their ph at home so the timing of uh, of uh, urine ph checking Yes, I, I prescribe when when the patient bought the the pH meter. I always say to to um, to analyze the P, the urinary pH twice the, um, twice a day, one in the morning and one in in, in evening. And when the patient is, uh, come back to the to the hospital, give me a, a paper with the with the pH control um, the pH control the last four three 
uh, weeks. I always uh, work the, the patient three or four weeks after the, the first the first time. And, and I will really like to, to show the, the pH control at, at home. Okay. So there are some other ones coming in. Um, there are there are some questions related to the uh, range of desired urine pH to achieve the actual lysis of the of the stone. What is the the pH range to to aim to? I, I cannot hear you. Sorry. Yeah, so the urine pH range that you want the patient to, to achieve in order to obtain uh, the stone dissolution. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it is here in the, the, um, the EAU guidelines give us a, a, a narrow margin and chemolysis is, is very special, it's up to 6.5. I have to, to try, no, no much more more than than seven because it's, it's, it's dangerous for for um, uh, create a, another type of stone uh, phosphate calcium stone but a, a type between 6.5 7 6.5 6.8 is, is better to dissolve okay so there is a question regarding the duration of medical treatment with, with regard to thiazide, but in general, how long would you recommend the patient to stay under medical treatment? Yes, and, and on the publication is is, is clear. It's, it's, it's between six weeks to six months, but normally I it depends. It depends the the follow up visiting in the, in the hospital. No, uh, I always I, I always watch the patient three four four weeks after the in, initial day. The, the um, treatment uh, first because I want to know if the patient is taking the pills or, or, or taking the the, um, the recommendation and I normally um, I made a, a x-ray by a non contact CT scan and two three months after after the treatment if the is the, um, the, 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 the solution is is partial, partial dissolution I, I, I achieve with the patient and uh, to make um, argument to, to when is the next next CT scan or, or, or ultrasound to do. But normal, normally after four five months is if the, the stone is no is no dissolved, uh, prescribe an active treatment. Always is the patient is asymptomatic. See, uh, if the patient is symptomatic. I, I change my 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 mind and, and prescribe the active treatment uh, earlier. Okay, thank you, Doctor Minus. I think we can conclude this session now. Very, very interesting and uh, very up to date. So I would like to conclude by thanking the organizers and. The outstanding speakers and uh, of course the uh, the participants who attended the, the session. Thank you so much. Good evening.